Okay, guys, we are on. Le I hope everybody's doing really well. Let's continue. We were on chapter three. Tavia has the book. I don't know who else has the book, but we had left off um, in this saying that in this chapter, the author of the gate of trust is giving us five concepts that we really have to grasp in order to um, develop this attribute of trust. And the first concept was to understand the seven qualities that elicit trust, which he discussed in chapter two in, in depth. So that's the first thing. And among those, we had ended that whole discussion with the idea of causality and the idea that um, we might, a person who doesn't understand how the world works might think that things are causing certain things and these things are causing certain things, right? But it's only because we, a person doesn't understand that really nothing, nothing in creation has independence, independent existence, meaning nothing can really cause anything else. Only by the will of God can things happen. It just is that God orchestrates things to move in such a way that things, re the outcome that God wants ends up happening. So we have talked about this idea of um, how God is the only one who creates something from nothing, whereas us human beings create something from something. So basically it's creation and formation, meaning I could take raw materials and reshape them into something else. I could take silver and make a silver cup, but it's just for, it's nothing new. How do I know that it's nothing new? It's because if I would, if the maker of that thing, that new cup would leave, the cup would still exist. It would never, it wouldn't be able to revert to hit its original and it's an original essence, its original essence. On the contrary, with creation, creation is of the it, it's, it's of the nature that if the maker of creation, if the creator stops creating, if it would leave, it would if it would stop speaking creation into it, then it would revert to nothingness. Right. So that's a difference. We make we make things from something. God makes them from nothing. So, for example, God can orchestrate the water, the wind, God can make the wind turn the water in the Red Sea into solid water, right? That's just changing the nature of water, but the water is still water because God created the water. And the author had given us this, this, he had told us like a person can see that the, 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 the most similar way that the most akin way that we can see this concept of creation from nothingness, um, something from nothing in nature is with the creation of a human being or with the exponential multiplication of, let's say, a seed into all, every seed that if, if a seed, um, what is that? If a, a, a seed grows and then there's a, from, from one grain, there's becomes 30 grains. And then that that grain develops into 10, 9,000 grains and the whole multiplication of the crops that comes just from one seed, we start getting that inkling understanding. It's still not the way God creates, but we start understanding how disproportionate it is. Well, that's how creation is completely disproportionate. And even more powerful is the example of a human being, right? From one drop of seed, this being becomes a human being. It's infinite. There's no, the, you, you can't comprehend it. That makes no, it, there's the, the, the logical steps that one would think are not there because there's infinity in it. That's what, th so th this is, it, it, that's how God creates. So why is he explaining this to us? Because he's trying to bring out the point that God is the only one who has an attribute of causality. It's the, he's the only one who can cause a real change. And we delude ourselves to thinking that in the natural way, there, in the natural order, there are things causing certain things. So because the president told this guy and that guy, then that guy did this. And because the stock market did, because this person did that, the stock market did that, right? We think think that that's what's causing it, a person 
of trust understands that that is not the case. That is never the case. God has orchestrated the outcome and all this series of events, all the domino, all the dominoes that are going to plop one after the other to cause the outcome. Then we had left up, we had left off with that. Now he's going to tell us um, the um, element number two of those five that we have to understand. And that's where I think this is where we left off, which is the idea of lip service or basically having sincerity. What does that mean? It's talking about the fact that God knows where we're holding. So let's read it inside. I'm on page 71. So the second introduction, meaning the second concept that we have to understand is that the person should know and it should be clear to him that the creator is watching over him and that nothing is concealed from him. Neither those actions that the person performs in public and are revealed for others to see, nor the actions that the person performs in private and are hidden from others. Even his thoughts are not concealed from God, right? Neither those that are hidden from other people, nor those that are apparent through his speech and actions. God also knows if the person's reliance on him is wholehearted or not. So we have to have sincerity. Bitachon, and bitachon means that we know where we're holding. Now, that, that doesn't mean that um, I have to have, we've, we've, we've mentioned several times that it's all a journey and there's, there's levels, right? And, 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 you know, one day we're here in the spectrum and another day we're here, like we're always working and we're moving in this spectrum. So it's not to say that there's no validity in being in that journey. What it's saying is that we have to understand that God knows where I am in the journey. Don't, don't delude yourself to thinking that you can actually pretend to be a person of Bitachon and that's going to somehow um, result in some deeper relationship. No, it, it, know where you are. God knows exactly where you are. That's part of the relationship. As the verse says, the Lord knows the thoughts of man and they are that they are vanity. And as it says, surely he understands the inner recesses of a person's heart. And as it says, for you alone know the heart of all people. Let me just check here something. Um, let me just, I feel like I had a, okay, fine. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find, I feel like I had a story um, for you on this, but anyway, so let me go on. When this becomes clear to the person who relies on God, then he will understand that it is improper to claim that he is a person who relies on God. May he be exalted as a result of his verbal expression without true reliance on him in his heart and in private. If he merely recites having trust, having bitachon, then he will be on the level of those about whom the verse says in Isaiah, with his mouth and with his lips, he honors me, but he distances his heart from me, right? So it, it basically, we have to approach this with sincerity. That's what he's telling us. We have to be clear on that. Now, the third thing that we have to understand is exclusivity, not just sincerity, and not just not understand first is understanding that God is the only one who has all those seven attributes that actually elicit trust. Number two is the sincerity that we have to have. Number three is the exclusivity. The third introduction necessary to have proper trust is that the person must single out God as the only one he relies upon for those things regarding which he is obligated to rely on him. And he does not partner in with any other being with him to rely both on God as well as on another being for his trust in God will be ruined when he partners another being with him. So it's not going to work, right? If I don't, and we have talked about this idea, like if I don't feel that you trust in me completely, then how is this relationship going to work? We have to actually have exclusive trust in only this entity that now we know is, is God. And we know why we know he has all the seven attributes and et cetera, et cetera. You surely know that which is said regarding King Asa of Judah, who, despite his great piety, relied upon the doctors at the time when he was ill, as it is written. And also when he was ill, he did not seek the Lord, only the doctors, and he was punished for this. So who is this king? So Asa is one of the is, is was one of the kings of the Jewish people when the kingdom was split between Israel and and and, and Judah. Um 
Asa was not a bad king. He was actually a good king, but it was at the same time as another king, King, king Yeravim, who was the evil king from the, the, the kingdom of Israel. At that time, here it's talking about the fact that it, despite the fact that Asa was not nearly in comparison, you know, to the, his his counter king, let's say, right? He was actually a good king, but his flaw and why he really was punished for was because he didn't rely on God when he needed to, and he instead relied upon doctors. So we have to take a pause, Aki, and and Aki huh, here, um, and we have to take a pause and really see what why the medical stuff, right? Like, let's talk about this for a second, right? We have to know that according to Judaism, and this is explained in the in the Gemara, it's explained in the Talmud that doctors have permission to heal. Doctors are a channel for healing, only for healing. When you go to a doctor, he doesn't have the power to do the opposite of healing. He is a conduit from God for healing. When we go to the doctor, we have to go to the doctor, by the way, we're not, we, we are not like, there are other religions that actually, I think it's Christian scientists and other faiths that actually believe that if I trust, then why should I go to a medical professional? That's not us. We understand that a doctor is an agent of God in the natural world to facilitate the healing and a good doctor is a doctor who gets this, is a doctor, a doctor who understands that he's just a conduit, that he has enough humility and space for God to understand that he's here to heal, not to do the opposite. And this is really, really important because sometimes we, when we go to a physician and they, they, they play an opposite role and give us um, other types of kind of like negative um, diagnosis and all sorts of things in a very negative way, as if they were declaring the opposite. Honestly, we have to run away because a doctor really is only being given the power to heal, not the power. I shouldn't say the only one who has the power is God, but he is a conduit. He's being given permission. The word is permission, not power, permission to heal. And that's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to try to heal. Um, so it's very important. Um, and there's so, so many stories about this idea of people were scared and people were scared to go to the doctor. And the Lubavitch Rebbe always said, like, understand that when you go to the hospital or when you go to the doctor, right, you are, if you, if the doctor says that you need to go to the hospital and you need to have that intervention or whatever it is, you're still under God's care. You're still under God's surveillance. The he, God is still watching over you. It's just that God has appointed that agent as the, um, that doctor as the agent to work, do what he needs to do. So Asa, um, this King was punished for his lack of trust in terms of, um, relying only on the doctors and not remembering. And this is an important part to remember that the doctor is, only an agent of God. And therefore, when I'm going to a doctor, I'm going because it's the will of God. This is the important piece. It's not because I rely on the doctor, but it's because I rely on God who has commanded me to take care of my body by going to a doctor. See the difference? Okay. It's a very important nuance difference. Okay. So as the verse says, blessed is the man who relies on the Lord and the Lord will be his support. And by the way, this is again, comes up again, again, again. This is the last verse of um, benching. When we, when we say the blessing after, after eating bread, that's the last verse. So whenever you guys say it again, now you'll like tune in that that verse it's, we're constantly saying it, it nourishes our trust. It is a well-known matter that when someone appoints two people or more to perform a specific task, the appointment will fail. Each one relies on the other to do the task. And in the end, it doesn't do done properly. And we've all experienced this to some extent, right? And you're working, you, you, you give somebody a responsibility, they get it done. You split it among a bunch of people and nothing ends up happening, right? So all the more so does this apply to a person who relies on God as well as on others. His reliance on God will be demolished. This will be the main reason why the matter about which he relied on God will be withheld from him. 
as the verse says, cursed is the man who relies on man and places flesh as his support and who removes his heart from the Lord. And here we go back some, to something I said a, a couple of weeks ago about, you know, it, it uses the word curse, but really what it's saying is it's just cause and effect. It's a natural consequence that if you don't rely on God and you put your trust, because we're always trusting something, like I said before, if you're alternatively putting your trust in, in man and that which is just creation, which is not foolproof, then evidently the results are going to be according, right? It's just a natural consequence. And we had said, from your perspective, you're going to experience things as though um, they had been orchestrated in the natural way. And that's not to say that we, we talked about causality before uh, at the beginning of our class. That's not to say that God isn't orchestrating everything. Of course, God is orchestrating everything, but God is going to orchestrate it in a way that you will feel as though the, the, nat the natural things that are happening are w the way, the only way that it is, right? It's from your perception. So that's going to be the consequence if you, that's what you rely on. That's exactly what, 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 you're, what you're doing. Now he's going to continue with obedience, which is a really interesting, a little bit of a it's, 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 it's a little bit of a counterintuitive topic and uh, hopefully it'll be, hopefully I'll do a good job of explaining it. I mean, for, for me, I, I think like I get it, but I could see how one could read this and be like, what? Um, so let's read through it. Let me turn off my WhatsApp. Let's three, read through it and see what exactly does, does he mean by this? Okay. So the fourth introduction or the fourth, the fourth thing that we need to understand is that the person should pay strong attention and make great efforts to uphold that which the creator has obligated him to do as part of his service to him, both to fulfill his mitzvot and to refrain from doing that which he has exhorted us not to do in accordance with his request. So he's saying you have to be observant, pun intended, right? You have to observe that which God has said that you should keep and that which God has said you shall not keep, the, 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 the thou shall and the thou shall not, right? For then the creator will agree to bestow on him the things which he relies on him, for which he relies on him. So then God is going to grant you whatever you're relying on him for. As the rabbis of blessed memory said, make his will like your will. And this is a very famous ethics of our father. Make his will like your will so that he may make your will like his will. Nullify your will before his will so that he may nullify the will of others before your will. So yeah, align your will with God's will. And then everything is going to move go smoothly. But with this requires explanation because we had said, if you remember, we had talked about the fact that God was kind even to the undeserving. So now we're sort of, is this sort of suggesting like that there's a limit to the kindness? Like if I don't do this, then the kindness is not coming. And that's not what it means. So this is, this is why I said this could be kind of counterintuitive and it could be read and be like, oh, wait, well, I thought that God was going to be kind. Or one could say, oh, I knew it. I knew that if I wasn't do, if I'm not, if I don't do this or that, God was going to be a punishment. You know, you know, those stories like the God that you believe in, believe in is not the one that I believe in, right? <laughs> I also don't believe in that. The, no, sorry, the God that you don't believe in is also the God that I don't believe in. I also don't believe in that God, right? That God that is out to get me and is out to punish me. So what is it saying here, Yael, right? Why is it saying that if, if you do what God wants you to do, then he will do the things that you rely on him. And if you align your will with him, then his will will be also your will. Let's move forward and then we'll try to see if we can grasp what it's saying. As the verse states, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and be nourished by faith. Similarly, it says the Lord is good to those who await him, to the soul that seeks him. However, as for a person who relies on the creator for his needs while rebelling against him, neglecting the observance of mitzvot, how foolish is he and how weak are his knowledge and understanding? Okay, so let's try to pause here and try to start understanding what he's what, what, what he's saying before, before, before he finishes the section. 
this is how it is. If I, God's kindness is infinite. There's no limit to the kindness. It goes to the deserving, to the undeserving, it, to everybody. That's all God does. He just gives and gives and gives. It's all abundant kindness. Now, this is speaking about, about a relationship. And a relationship is not tit for tat, is not quit for pro quo. It's not if I, I do this for you so that you do this for me. And also, under, let, we have to understand that if I say, and we can, we can, we can sort of get it. I, I heard an explanation from Rabbi Taub coming from um, the 12 step um, the 12 step program. And I'll, I'll share in a second, but we have to understand that if I trust in God, if I say, I trust in God, talking about the previous one, the, the, the sincerity, the no lip service, right. Then how could I not do what God, who I'm the God that I'm relying on has told me has said is good for me. Do you see what I'm saying? So when God says, don't worry, you don't have to work on Saturday. It's all taken care of. I rely on you and therefore I don't do it, right? But if I don't, if I do work on Saturday, for example, right? I'm saying, oh, I actually don't rely on you fully because I, I like that that you're saying you're taking care of me, right? That doesn't make sense to me. Therefore, I'm, I'm actually not relying on you. So you see what I'm saying? So if God has given me a, a talk about the doctor, right? If the doctor has given me a prescription and I have to follow the doctor's orders, right? And I say, oh, no, 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 but I don't trust in what this doctor is saying. So I'm not going to follow the prescription. Like this is not, it doesn't even begin to be a compare. But if God is saying that diet is not so good for your spiritual DNA. And I say, oh, no, 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 but I, I think it should be good for my DNA. So then all of a sudden, like, do I really trust? right? If I'm leaning back and saying, okay, I, you got me, like, I get it. Like you got me, you know, me intimately, right? We, we go through all the, um, all those attributes, right? You, you know, me from the beginning of time till the end, you know, what's good for me. You know, you're strong, right? You're the only one who has the strength. Oh, but if, when it comes to this thing, all oh, that diet thing and that working on, on Saturday thing, I don't get it. Right. So that means they can't, they, they don't go together. I'm muting you. How do I do that? They don't go together. They, 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 they can't go together. So that's what it's saying here. So it's not, it's not a real relationship. I've, I've by, by, by not, by not getting this piece of the, you know, obligation, quote unquote, part of this relationship is we're actually not trusting. Let me continue inside and see what he says. For a person knows that if someone is appointed to by another to do a specific task, whether he is entrusted, instruct, uh, instructed to involve himself in one of the other's needs or whether he is instructed to refrain from a certain matter and he then goes and disobeys those instructions, when the one who appointed him finds out that he disobeyed the instructions, it will be strong grounds to refrain from doing that which the appointee had relied upon him to do. So here's going back to that thing that makes us so uncomfortable. But, but, it, but, it, but in using this human example, it makes sense, right? Like if I think you trust in me and all of a sudden I found that I told you to do something that because you came to me trusting me and I said, no, do this step A, B, C, right? You come to me with a business problem and I tell you do A, B, C, and then you don't do it. Then like, I'm just going to pull back. Like, okay, so do whatever you can, whatever you want. I thought you trusted me. I thought you wanted my, my help, right? I, you're counting on me. I'm delivering for you, but you're not doing what I'm telling you that needs to be done. Right. But yes, but there's a deeper, a deeper idea that we have to understand here, which is what I said before, this is a relationship. And so it, it's, it can't be that I say I trust. And then I don't trust that whatever you're telling me is good for me is actually good for me. So you see what I'm saying? So it, 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 ha it has to go both ways. Oh, Galit is here. You would have appreciated all the talk that we said about doctors because she's a doctor um 
So he says, if this applies with respect to reliance on human beings, all the more so would it apply to someone who disobeys God's statutes and mitzvot, which he designated for our observance and warned us about them. The hopes of the one who relies on God will be dashed when he rebels against him, and he will not be fitting to be classified as a person who relies upon God. So it's exactly what I just said, right? If I, if I don't follow what the plan that God has given me is I actually become, I am a person who rely, who doesn't, um, rely on God. Only a person who, only a person who's following that, which God is saying is good for them is actually exhibiting that they, they trust. So <clears throat> it's not that I do things, I do these obligations, this mitz mitzvot or these commandments, right? I do them because then I'm going to get something from you. It's that I do them because I trust you, right? So it's much deeper. It's a relationship. It's not an exchange. It's not a business transaction, right? It's like you take an intimate relationship and now you've turned it into a business transaction, something transactional. Well, that's not what it was, right? It was a marriage. It was an intimate relationship. It's not a business transaction. So that's exactly what it is. Our relationship with God and the obligations that we have in this relationship is not about I do so that you give me. No, it's about we're in the relationship. And because I trust you, then I trust all of you. See what I'm saying? So then I follow what you're saying is good for me. Do I understand that? Of course, I don't, I don't always understand that, but that, but, but. If, if I wait till I understand it, then, then by definition, then I'm not trusting, right? If I wait till I understand everything that the doctor is telling me to do, then by definition, I'm not trusting the doctor, right? And nobody in the right mind would do that. Okay. Rather, he is like the person about which it says, for what is the hope of a flatterer who robs when God casts off his soul? Will God hearken to his cry? And as it says, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely? And then it says in the following verse regarding those people, will you come and stand before me in this house, the temple, upon which my name is called? And then it says, has this house upon which my name is called become a cave of degenerate men? men. It's basically saying that all, even if you stand with, you know, in the presence of God, sort of speak, in the place where God was the most revealed in the temple, um, with bitachon as a sinner, obviously you don't have bitachon. You don't have trust if you're adulterous and you're a murderer and you're doing all these things, right? It's not, even if you're standing in that holy place, that's not going to protect you. So don't think that, that like, just because you claim to have this bitachon, but you're not acting on it, that that's going to protect you. But it's not because the kindness of God is not there. Of course, the kindness is going to flow. And he's going to talk later in the book about how, you know, evil people get, get a lot in life and people who are not, who are righteous don't and all these crazy things. But we, what we have to get from this is that it's a relationship. And so the obligations in the relationship are, based on trust. That's exactly the foundation of the relationship. Um, and now we're going to get to human effort, which is one of our favorite parts, hopefully, at least it's one of my favorite parts. But up till now, any questions on and what we just what we reviewed from the last chapter and what we've said up until now? Any questions? You can mute yourself or you can put them in chat. We're good? Okay. So all good. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to Number five. Now, this is the last one of the things that we have to understand in order to develop trust, and that is the role of human effort, um, as opposed to animals who everything is readily available for them. I mean, they still have to do certain things, right? The cat has to run after the mouse kind of thing, right? We have to do a little bit more effort to obtain our livelihood. And by the way, even with health, we said it before, right? We have to put in the effort to call the doctor and to go to the doctor and to get a second opinion. Like that is part of what we are supposed to do when we're following the mitzvah of taking care of our body, right? Okay. But let's go to effort. The person should clearly see that the completion of all the matters that come to be in this world after its creation come to be in one of two ways. I just remembered what I wanted to share with you before. There's something really cute that I heard that said, don't do Hashem's work, not his job. 
And it was so cute, but because it, it's so true. It's like, well, now we're going to talk about effort. Like we have to do God's work, not his job. What does that mean? It means we do, we serve God. Like we do what he needs us to do. All the mitzvahs, taking care of people, being kind, all the things, all the things that are good for our body and our soul and for humans, for society at large, right? All of the work that we've been put here to do, we do, but we're not going to do his job. He has a job to do. So this connects both to what I said before and now to the part of effort. That's why I just remembered it. Okay. So, okay. So the completion of all the matters that come to be in this world after its creation come to be in one of two ways. One of the manners in which they come to be is solely due to the decrease of the creator, may he be exalted, and due to his desire that these things should immediately come into existence. So one of the ways we get things, it's because God says, this is what's going to happen right now. The second manner in which they come to be is through various means and intermediaries. So there's more layers here. Some of those intermediaries are immediate, while some of them are remote. Some are revealed and some are hidden, but all of them hasten to complete that which God has decreed should be and the way those things should appear while God helps them accomplish. This is very closely related to that idea of causality that I explained earlier today, where all these things are in place, but only because God has already decided on the outcome that he wants to happen. And then he puts all these things in motion. Okay. So we are required to know that while everything is coming straight from God, like manna from heaven, like bread from heaven, there are things that God has said are going to come immediately without much um, action needed on our part. And there are things that God allows us to have to have to do more things and have more steps in, in you know, in between the, the out, in between now and the desired outcome. An example of an immediate cause would be the drawing of water. And this is interesting. He, the, the analogy of water is not, uh, it's not just random. Actually, water represents blessings. So I'm pretty sure that this is, um, this is why it's chosen. Um, the drawing of water from the depths of the earth by means of a pulley and a jog tied to it that draws the water out of the well. The remote cause, so the immediate cause would be, okay, so we draw the water, right? But then there's remote, remote causes, and that would be the person who ties the animal to the rope that is attached to the vessel, and then his moving of the animal that pulls the rope to draw the water from deep in the well to the surface. So there's all these things that are happening so that the water comes, is drawn. Then there are those causes that are between the person and the vessel. So the things that are being used to draw out the water, which are intermediary causes between two manners. They are the animal, the wheels that moved each other and the rope. So there are the actions that happen in between, right? The person who tied the rope and the animal and moved the animal. And then there are the actual things that were made in order for these things to happen. If any of these aforementioned causes were ruined, the intended goal, which was drawing the water, would not come to be. So meaning God has orchestrated it that everything is falling into place so that I could get my water, so that I could receive the blessing. The blessing is there. And then there's all these things that are happening in the middle. Similarly, for other actions, Similarly, for other actions that come to be, they do not come to be as a result of people's actions or through any other entity. So don't delude yourselves, right? We should not delude ourselves to thinking that anybody else, we talked about it last week, that anybody else has any actual power or that we have any actual power, right? They do not, these actions do not come to be as a result of people's actions or through any other entity. Rather, they all exist due to the decree of God and his preparation of the means let me just let somebody in the room. His preparation of the means through which the action will be completed. As the verse says, to him, all the causes had, have been counted. Hey, Marcy, if you, if you have the book and you want to follow along, I'm in page 82. 82 of the book, okay? 
as it says, who is great in counsel and master and carrying it out. And as it says, for it was something brought about by the Lord. If the means were lacking, then nothing would come to be as a result of the natural activities, right? So everything is there perfectly in place so that the water is drawn, so that the blessing comes to us. When we contemplate a person's needs and how he is required to engage in various means and to exert himself in order to obtain his needs, then we will clearly observe this to be the case, that without the various means, the matter will not come into actuality. For example, now he's going to tell us that we always need to do some amount of effort in order to get what we need. Even if, even if, if, even when the, the manna fell from heaven, right, there were only the righteous people who needed to walk to their front step and get it. Then there were the people who were the, the Benonim, the intermediary, who only needed to take a few steps right outside their door. And then there were the Rashaim, the people who weren't so great, so spiritually elevated, and they needed to walk outside the camp, right? The manna fell, the blessing was there. It's just there's effort that needs to happen and different people have to make a different amount of effort as we're going to see later on. For someone needs food, right? So when someone needs food, even if the food is placed in front of him in a state already fit to it, eat, it's already ready. If he doesn't exert himself to eat, by, eat it by raising it to his mouth and chewing, he will not satiate his hunger. So even at a minimum, you have to understand that you're always going to have to make effort. Even if God gave it to you, like the, 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 the sandwich dropped in your hand, you still need to pick it up and, and bring it to your mouth and chew it. Similarly, someone who is thirsty and in need of water will also need to raise the water to his mouth to drink. All the more so is effort necessary if the food is not ready for him to eat. So, so right. So like we said, some people got everything ready made. They, they just right. It was right there. Some people needed to go out and they actually needed to knead the dough and make the whole thing. Right. So let's read inside. If effort is necessary, all the more so is effort necessary if the food is not ready for him to eat so that he is required to exert himself to prepare it by grinding the flour, kneading the dough, baking the dough into bread and the like. So sometimes if we don't have it, we have to, we have to do that. But then there's more exertion, more exertion that this will be necessary and it will be even more difficult if he needs to buy it as well as prepare it. So now he's going to have to work to get money to then buy it, to then prepare it, to then eat it. So you see, there's many things that need to happen when it comes to effort in order to get that blessing. Um, even more assertion that this will be necessary if he lacks the money with which to buy the food, in which case he will need a far greater exertion and involvement in various means than that which has been mentioned earlier. For then he will be required to hire himself out for work to sell some of his objects and possessions or the like, because he's going to need the money to buy the things. Okay. So up to here, before we enter into the reason why this is so now he's told us there's effort, no matter what, <laughs> everybody's going to have to make some level of effort. Okay. There's going to be different levels of effort, but there's always going to be effort required. This is a beautiful story about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement. Um, we have to understand that these people were in a level of like, when we talk about mastering bitachon, that's exactly where they were, right? A, a level of bitachon, a very, very, very high level of trust where the, the story goes that there was one time that the Baal Shem Tov needed to collect money for whether it was for him or whether it was for, for a mitzvah or whatever it was. So he went to somebody's house. He went to this wealthy individual's house or the, you know, or whatever, an individual's house. And he knocked on the door and then he ran off and the man came after him. Hey, 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 and caught up to him and gave him the money. And the Baal Shem Tov, and opened his wallet and gave him money. And the Baal Shem Tov student said, we are very confused. If you needed to collect money from this person, why didn't you stay by the door? And if you didn't need it, then why did you come all together? Like, what, what is this like knocking the door and then leaving, but then taking the money? And so the Baal Shem Tov says, well, you don't understand. I am only required to make effort. I knew that I needed to do something. 
So I just need to knock on the door and God takes care of it. Right. So obviously we're not at that level. We don't, but, 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 but that, that's that the point is that there's always going to be some amount of effort involved. In fact, of the great um, Rev Susha, it is also said, Rev Susha was also one of these like very, very righteous individuals who was like at such a, such a high level. Um, there's a, there's one of the famous stories of Rev Susha. Sherry, you may have heard me say this one before because it's one of my favorites. Um, Rev Susha used to take a very, very long time in prayer. And in the morning when he prayed, um, at the end of his prayers, he would then say, Master of the universe, Reb Susha is hungry. And his, um, his what do you call it? His servant, his, um, his gabai, his, his assistant would then know that it's time to, rep, to serve Reb Susha breakfast. And he would bring out the tray and would bring the breakfast. And this happened every single day. He would pray shacharis and then he would say, Master of the universe, Reb Susha is hungry. And this um, assistant would come with a tray of food and would serve him until one day this assistant got really fed up with this. And he said, you know what, who does this Susha think he is like the master of the universe does not bring him the food. I bring him the food every day. I have to cut the tomatoes and, da -da 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 and bring the tray like I'm going to show him something tomorrow. I'm not going to bring him the tray. Let's see what happens. So the next day, Reb Susha prays and Reb Susha says, master of the universe, Reb Susha is hungry. And the assistant stays with her hands crossed in the kitchen and does not make a move. All of a sudden, there's a knock and he runs to the door and there's a guy with trays and there's pe more people coming with trays. And he's saying, is Reb Susha home? We just had a Brit and we have all this leftover food and we figure Reb Susha could use it. And the assistant says, I get it. It's not me who provides for Reb Susha. It's really Hashem. Like, it's just, it's, it's crazy. As we would say in Spanish, insolito, right? In, insolito. This is another level, right? Yes, I also love that story, Liz. It's, 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 it's another level. But the point is that there is still some effort, right? <laughs> the Vashem Tov needed to knock on the door. Reb Susha needed to say, I need the food. And then he, it was brought to him and he needed to put it in his mouth, et cetera. Okay. So there's always going to be effort. Now let's talk about the reason for human effort. Um, why? Because if God can do anything and we can fully rely on God, couldn't he have made it that we didn't have to put any effort? He could have, right? Like he could have made it that we just got everything without, um, without having to put an effort. So let's see inside page 83. There are two reasons why the creator deemed it in such a way that a person must make efforts to pursue and search for the means of his livelihood and other needs. But let's see, why does he want us to run around um, trying to figure out, um, you know, doing the motions, as I like to say, doing the motions to get our needs. The first reason is that God, in his wisdom, decided to test the person as to whether he will choose to serve God or to rebel against him. Hmm. Therefore, he tested him in a matter through which the path he chose will be evident. God did, th did this by causing a person to be needy and lacking that which is outside of him, be it food, drink, clothing, shelter, or cohabitation. He then instructed the person to pursue these things and obtain them through means that he prepared for them, but only in specific manners and at specific times. So basically, it could be that God is testing us. Are you going to do these things in a way that I've prescribed you to do them, right? Because God has given us that blueprint that I spoke about before of how you go about fulfilling your needs. It's not like, oh, I have a need for food and then I just go eat whatever I want. No, there are ways to eat. There are ways not to eat. Like every single, every single need that I have, right? Is, uh, is clearly stated there's, there's a blueprint um, um, here, like here in the footnote, it says about, for example, planting, right? There are laws on how you plant. There are laws on grafting. There are all sorts of laws on how to do these things. So it's a test. You have needs so that you can also engage in this relationship and, and, and be an active part of following the, the, the blueprint, the, 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 your part of the relationship, let's see. Let's say, um, okay, those things that the creator decreed that the person will obtain, 
he will obtain as a result of God making available all the means that he requires while those things that God did not decree that he will obtain, he will not obtain because those means will be withheld from him. So if it's not for me, then it's not, um, wait, actually don't get what he said. Those things that the creator decreed that the person will obtain, he will obtain as a result of God making available all the means. Oh, okay. That he requires. Well, those things that God did not decree that he will obtain, he will not obtain because it will be withheld for him. Okay. So he's going back to the idea that God is making it so that things are happening in the way that they should happen. So whatever is happening is orchestrated by God. So don't think that you can advance or accelerate or move things in another way to get these things because you're not going to get them. Now, let's continue. As a result, it will become clear if he wishes to serve God or disobey him based on his choice of the means with which to obtain his needs. So it's part of the test, right? A part of the relationship, it's going to become really obvious um, if I'm in it to serve my creator and fulfill my mission in this world or in order to basically serve myself because it's going to be depending on the choices that I make as I'm trying to satisfy my needs and in, in my in my physical needs that it's going to reveal that on account of this, he will either be rewarded or punished, even if he did not end up obtaining that which he tried to obtain. The second reason why God deemed, and I think this one is more powerful and probably easier to understand, at least for me. The second reason why God deemed that people be required to exert effort and employ various means to obtain their livelihood is that if a person did not need to exert himself to pursue and search for means of sustenance, he would rebel and pursue that which is forbidden. And he would not heed his obligations towards God in exchange for the kindness of God towards him. As the verse states, and there are harp and lute, tambourine and flute and wine at their drinking feast. The work of the Lord they do not regard and the deed of his hands they have not seen. Similarly, it says, and Yeshurun became fat and rebelled. You grew fat, thick and plump. Israel forsook the God who made him. Basically, why did I say this one is easier to understand? Because what it's basically saying is that if I'm not kept busy, I actually might be just a wild madman, right? Like, like it's part of keeping me busy and productive. And we saw like, even we saw with the pandemic, right? Like so many people were just getting all these checks from the government and just not being busy and productive. And they, like, literally like crime rate went up. Like there was just so much idleness going up because like people need to be productive. So part of this effort being, yeah, it's like taking things for granted. Exactly. Part of including effort in the paradigm that God has set up is because we have to keep busy. Otherwise we're going to stray. We're going to just go after our own, who knows what, instead, instead of staying, being productive, constructive citizens of the world. That's, and I think that's at least for me, a very, a very powerful thing. Um, in a similar vein, the rabbis of blessed memory said, Torah study goes well with Derek Eretz with work because the toil of both of them makes this deep misdeed scars. Any Torah study that is not accompanied by work will cease in the end and lead to misdeed. This is what I just said, right? And, and we know that, by the way, in Torah, you know, the sages of the Torah were, we, were tanners and were winemakers and were like all sorts of things. There was always work involved because it's just part of God wants us to be busy. There's no such thing. God wants us to. That's why he gave us intellectual capabilities or strength in physical strength or mental strength. Like that's part of it. He wants us to be using it productively. All the more so would someone rebel if he lacks both of these and pays no heed to either of them, meaning if he lacks in Torah study and um and um, and in Derek Eretz in work. So we need both. We need to dedicate time to serve our creator with our Torah study and learning. And we also need to be engaged in the world. That's what God wants. 
It is due to the compassion of the creator that he preoccupied man all the days of his life with obtaining worldly needs and with Torah and mitzvot, which serve as a provisions for the world to come so that he will have no time to seek out that which he does not need and that which he is not able to com comprehend with his intellect, such as those matters pertaining to the beginning of creation and the end of the world. Meaning God in his kindness has made us people who are going to be busy with things that are going to be concerned with our physical needs and our ambitions and all that so that we don't go after things that are not good for us, right? So that we don't stray. As the wise man, King Solomon said, also the world he placed into their hearts so that man should not find the deed that God did from beginning to end. One second, because I do want to, I want to, I want to see if anybody found the footnote that talks about the beginning and the end. I think he's saying something here that I don't know what exactly is. There's a footnote here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look this up because there might be more than I than I than I just explained here that I didn't I didn't catch, and I will look it up for next class. But it's it's important to note this principle. So being busy, being meaning being busy and engaged in the world to fulfill our material needs is part and parcel of being a servant of God. However, we have to always remember that that pursuit is not really something that has an, that we have an impact on. The only pursuit that we actually impact the results is any pursuit that has to do with divine service any pursuit we said this in the last class any effort that is in our advancement if in torah and mitzvahs and serving hashem and doing what hashem wants that yields results the rest is just we're going through the motion so it's important to know that because people get we spend a lot of time consumed by all sorts of physicality and we for we in, in really in reality that's completely empty because it's just going through the motions and when we should sorry when we should what's it called when we should really be engaging our time and our energy in matters of divine service okay let's wrap it up with the last thing he's going to say here about the righteous person so here he's going to talk about the balshemtas and the rosushas of the world that i just gave you two nice stories if a person strengthens himself in the service of God, choosing to be fearful of him and to rely on him with regard to both Torah and worldly matters, so we're relying on God for both. Additionally, if he turns away from inappropriate character traits and instead strives towards good character traits and he does not rebel against God, even at times when he's at rest from his stresses and does not turn toward leisure, Rather, he constantly involves himself with the service of God, not being swayed by his evil inclination or the indulgences of the world. Then, in turn, such a person will be re relieved from the need to exert himself in the search to obtain his sustenance. That would be the Baal Shem Tov. All he had to do is knock on the door. That would be Rav Susha. All he had to do is Rav Susha is say uh, Rav Susha is hungry. For the two reasons mentioned above regarding why a person is required to make efforts to provide for him, for him, one being that it's a test, right? The purpose of testing man so that God see, sees if he's going to choose God or not, if he's going to choose the things that are permitted to him or not. And number two, um, that he is not, that he doesn't rebel against him. Those reasons don't apply to him because we're talking about a very righteous individual where he's always going to choose God no matter what, and he's not going to rebel against God. So they, it doesn't apply. Therefore, they don't need to exert effort. Instead, he will be sustained without any exertion or, or hard work according to his needs and sustenance. As it is written, the Lord will not starve the soul of the righteous. Okay, so this is actually a really good place to stop before we talk about how the righteous suffer and the wicked um, prosper. And I want to go back um, and look into this one footnote here that I'm not um, and make sure that there was nothing in the in this in page 89 that I missed. But let me just ask if there are any questions so far. Um, any questions so far? Let me look in the chat. Yes, Liz says it like taking questions so far on kind of what I what we discussed today. Um, 
Anybody? Are we good? Okay, excellent. I, I want to share one last thing before we before we take off that there is a talking about this idea of, you know, not paying lip service that we started. It was like sort of how at the beginning of class, we were talking about the sincerity. There is this um, this Mishnah in Perke Avos and Ethics of Our Father, Fathers that talks about the fact that in a place where um, where there's no man, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It says in a place where there's no man, strive to be a man. Yeah, you've heard that one. Yes, Marcy says, yes, you've heard it, right? And it usually means, what does it mean? Is like in a place where nobody's taking charge, nobody's being the adult, nobody's taking leadership, you need to be the leader. And it's, it's a, it's a incredible concept and it's so true right and by the way and you see that the jewish people that's we really emulate that right like right away we're stepping up to help and doing things right so this is a very important concept step up and take charge but i heard something really really a little twist on this that is that was really very interesting very telling and it was um the explanation was like this in a place where there's no man well where is such a place the only place where there's no man is in your mind and in your heart, because no one knows, no one really knows what's going on in there. Even your spouse, even your the person who's closest to you, right? No one has access to your mind or your heart, truly, right? So where is such a place? Where is a, in a place where there's no man? That's your heart or, and your mind strive to be a man, meaning that's where you have to be a mensch, right? That's where you really have to act and control yourself. That's where the inner work is. So this is just, right? It's beautiful, right? So again, when we're talking about bitachon, the idea of sincerity, this is, this is where this, um, this example falls in, um, we have to remember where we're holding. Only we know where we're holding, but God knows where we're holding, right? God also knows. So we can't just pretend. We have to be honest with ourselves um, where we're holding. And it's okay that, um, that we are in the journey. It doesn't mean that, oh, now I have to be completely perfect. I have to be the Bashem of the Rav Suja, and then I might as well not try. No, not at all. It's we know we have to know that God Almighty knows exactly where we are. We have to be genuine in the relationship. Again, it all goes back to the relationship. It's a relationship. And then as, 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 as we continued today, we saw that we talked about this relationship, meaning if the obedience, the next step afterwards was the obedience, right? Like if I'm in this relationship and I say I'm trusting and I'm approaching trust with sincerity, then am I really trusting if I'm not, acting on that trust, if I'm not like fulfilling my obligations, I, it, it, it can't be, it's incongruent. And so I have to work with myself on that and really recognize that, oh, this is an area of growth because then I'm really not exhibiting trust. Right. So it's a whole journey, but we have to be honest and understand the kind of like what the paradigm is. And as we're closing today's session, we're talking about, oh, the righteous, well, the righteous don't even have the test. They don't have the temptation that we, we have. Like, am I really going to choose that mitzvah right now? Well, I don't really feel like it. Right. Oh, but God really says that that's what I need to do right now. And I kind of, I'm working on that trust thing. And that trust thing is important. Well, the righteous don't have that dilemma that they, they're not being tested that way. They don't have that yet. Sahara. They don't have that evil inclination. They don't have that drive. Okay. So that's kind of like a little bit of a summary. And then next week we will talk about the righteous suffering and the wicked prospering. And we will probably, yay, finish chapter three. Chapter three happened to have been, I hope we finish it. I don't know, because it's a pretty long chapter. It happens to be that it's a very, very long chapter. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot in it. But anyway, any other, any questions, comments, or are we good? No, Marcy, I'm so happy you came. Tavia, awesome. Okay, great. So I'll see you next week, same time. Have a good night. Have an awesome week. And keep me posted if anything comes up and any questions come up, okay? Thank Bye, you. Bye, guys. Good